All right, today the next lecture, we're going to talk about logo programming and actually using the Siemens LogoSoft software to program the logo PLC. So a couple of quick things before we get into it. This obviously is your Siemens logo. Um, some review stuff for you. How many inputs on this guy? Eight. Eight. How many outputs are on him? Four. Four outputs. What are the different methods that we can program the logo with? Um, keypad. Keypad programming. PC. PC using the software. And the EEPROM. And the EEPROM, which is like a floppy disk for the logo. All right. IEC 1131 I think we've talked about a little bit already. Um, the only thing maybe to take note on right now, the only thing I'd really like for you guys to know right now at this point, is that as far as IEC 1131 is concerned, the logo only has two programming languages. And those languages are ladder diagram and function block diagram. These other languages are reserved more for, uh, for other, other PLCs. Uh, we don't even list one of them up there, the statement list, which is a form of structured text. Um, that would be on the next model of PLC that we're going to go into, the S7224. So and there's some other ones up there, instruction list, sequential function chart. Some of these look like flow charts. Some of them look like just text-based programming. And obviously our function block and our ladder diagram are the ones that we may be most used to seeing because they resemble things that we've already used in other quarters. Things like uh, ladder logic, uh, relay logic. Um, I would even venture to say function block diagram isn't that dissimilar to, uh, to multisim that you may have touched a little bit in second quarter. So. Or lab view if you have any electronics programming experience. So the demonstration that we're going to do today, we're going to take a program, we're going to create a program inside of LogoSoft and then we could dump that program into the logo. And what do we need to dump that program into the logo? Your RS-232 USB cable. The, the USB programming cable, that's correct. And it'll actually plug in the same port that you see right here as where we, uh, as where we would plug the EEPROM in. All right? So we'll go into a demonstration. What I want you guys to do is go into your desktop or wherever the software might be. You're going to have an icon. And that icon should say LogoSoft Comfort <coughs> version 5.0. Okay. Once you guys find that, launch the software. You're going to come into a big gray screen. The big gray screen is going to have really nothing on it. I like to uh, I like to maximize the screen so I have more space to work with. Okay. The easiest way to get started. At this point, I have a couple icons available to me. I can create a a new document or a new program. I can open a, an existing program that I've saved onto my computer or I can do a logo to PC. What is logo to PC? That's the opposite direction of downloading it. That would be uploading it. Pulling it off of the logo and putting it onto my PC. Okay. I don't have a download button available right now because of the fact that I have no program open. If I had a program open, I could see a download. So what we'll do is we'll come over to this new document, click that little down arrow, and it's going to bring up a screen. Notice what that screen says. It says I can program in either function block or ladder diagram. Function block diagram or ladder diagram. And for about 95% of the programs that you write in this lab, we're going to deal mainly with ladder diagram. Ladder diagrams are the most common programming language in the United States. Outside of the United States, Function block diagram is much more common. Uh, statement lists, instruction lists, structured text. These are more common languages outside of the United States. But in the United States, we tend to deal with ladder diagram. And as electricians or electronics technicians or any type of uh, electrical type of technician, a ladder diagram will make sense to you because it resembles the relay logic that you're used to seeing. So I'll click on ladder diagram. And notice as soon as you click on ladder diagram, it it brings up a, a big screen now. It brings up a grid and it brings up a power rail down the left hand side of the screen. Okay? That power rail is where I'm going to make my connections. You could think of that if this was physical wiring, we might call that L1 or plus 24 or whatever voltage we're starting with, right? So 
To create a circuit, all we got to do is work inside this tools bin on the left hand side of the screen and dump things onto the screen. One of the nice things about LogoSoft that will go away when we get to the larger PLC, the S7200, is that LogoSoft has a built-in simulation tool. Okay? The built-in simulation tool allows you to test and debug your program without actually having the hardware there. So you can actually run the, the program like you're running it on the real hardware with lights and switches and push buttons. Okay? Um, that's why we tend to start out with the logo in this quarter because you guys can take this software home, you can uh, work on the program, you can test the program at home and see if it works prior to even coming into the lab and wiring it up and turning it on and even downloading it. You don't even have to download it to a logo to test it, right? You can do it. The PC will actually emulate the logo hardware and we'll actually see it run within the PC. So we'll do that today. The most simple thing we can do is we could create a, a make contact. So if you grab a make contact and just drag one onto the screen. So just drag your make contact onto the screen. And as soon as you do, it's going to give you a selection. It's going to say, okay, what do you want to address that contact as? That contact could be addressed to an input. If it was the holding contact, it could be addressed to an output, to a coil. It could be addressed to a timer, a counter, things that we haven't even talked about yet. Okay. In this case, we're going to address it to an input. So I'm going to double click on I1 and place that contact in my screen. Now what does I1 correspond with? Input 1. Input 1. And what it, where, where is that on the PLC? That top left screw terminal, right? The one that's addressed I1. So when voltage is felt on that screw terminal, what do you suppose happens to that contact? Closes. It closes. What if I was to have a contact in here called I1 break contact? It would open. That would open when the I1 screw terminal is energized. So if I were to energize the I1 screw terminal right now, the I1 normally open contact would close. That's this one up here. And if I was to energize the I1 screw terminal right now, the I1 normally closed contact would open. Inside of LogoSoft, we call these make and break contacts. I'm going to try to make these a little bigger for the sake of the, uh, if I can, we'll see if it works here. Might not be able to find a way to make it real bigger real quick here. Alright, I guess, well, oh I know what I can do. I can zoom in one. There we go. You guys don't have to do this. What I've done is I've just zoomed in a little bit just for the sake of the camera to make it a little easier to see. So there's my I1 make contact, which is the normally open contact, and my I1 break contact. Does this not look just like relay logic? Yeah, it's, it's essentially the same as relay logic. Now what I can do is I can put in relay coils. So if I put a relay coil in here, like that, and maybe I put in a Q2 down here. So now I have Q1 and Q2 that are inserted in my circuit. Okay. What does Q1 correspond to? The output. The output screw terminals. Those output screw terminals are what type of output? R. Dry. Dry contact or relay output. Very good. Very good. All right, so these are relay outputs. There's two sets of screw terminals along the bottom, Q11, Q12. Those would correspond to this Q1. Q21 and Q2 screw terminals would correspond to this Q2. We could actually look at those on there. There's Q11, there's Q12. So when that coil energizes inside a LogoSoft, this contact will actually close, right? And the input one, when it energizes, that's what will change the state of these I1 contacts. All right. To connect them up, I'd like for you guys to go back and grab this connector tool. You can actually do it right now from here, but the problem is, is if you still have relay coils selected up here and you accidentally click somewhere, guess what it does? It plugs another one in, right? So I can delete that and I can go to this connection tool. It looks like a couple of arrows. There's also a hotkey for it, just like any Windows software. How many different ways can you do the same thing inside of Word? 
Yeah, a whole lot. I don't even know. Maybe five, six, seven different ways. There might be a hotkey, there might be a drop down menu, there might be an icon, and then there might be combinations of in between, right? We're going to grab the connection tool and we're going to connect Q1 up to I1, and then I'm going to connect I1 to the power rail. Okay? And then we'll do the same thing with Q2. But before you do it to Q2, I want to show you something. Let's say that I want to move this up a little bit. Okay? I can select this selection tool, this little arrow up at the top. When I select that selection tool, I can draw a big box right around those two contacts and slide them up if I want. See how I did that? And then go back to the connection tool and I'm going to connect that one up. Probably the most simple uh, logo program you can write there. We're literally 10 minutes into this lecture, I think, and you guys have just written your first logo program. Yay. Yay. <laughs> now the nice thing is, what did I tell you you could do on LogoSoft that you won't be able to do on MicroWin? Simulate. Simulate it. So I could at this point, you see the red down arrow, I could at this point download the program. I could also do it using the control D. If I mouse over that function, I could go to control D. But we're not currently connected to a logo. So I cannot download this program right now. So what I'm going to do instead is I'm going to simulate it right now. There's a little icon down here, and it looks like a bunch of function blocks or a bunch of contacts that are hooked together. And it's called simulate. Okay, and notice there's a hotkey for, for it, F3. And for some reason, I think that that might be something you might see in the future here somewhere, remembering the hotkey for simulation. So it might be a pre-job question or a test question or a homework question or something. Whenever I can remember those, I might try to help you out a little bit on that stuff. Um, so the simulation button, let's hit that simulation button. Oh, I've got something going on in this circuit somewhere. I've got an extra contact down here. So I'll turn mine off and delete this extra contact. Remember I said if you leave something selected and you accidentally click somewhere, sometimes you'll end up with a contact somewhere on the screen. That's what happened to me. So now I'm going to click the simulation button and notice what it does. It's telling me, okay, I1's not on right now. And for, this, for the purpose of this simulation, I1's going to be a switch. All right? I1's not on right now. So which contact is closed, the make or the break? break? The break contact, the normally closed contact. So right now, Q2 is on, okay? And you can see down here it's a light. In, in all actuality, though, Q1 could be what? Could be a, could be a fan, a motor, could be a solenoid valve, could be anything you want it to be, could be a light, all right? Q2 in this case is on. When I hit this switch, what's gonna happen? One goes on, two goes off. If I hit it again, they're just going to alternate. So wait, now that's energized. That's energized. Energized is when the the uh, Q1 is on. when the line is red. The box will also turn red. But if you look down here, there's a status too. Right down here, there's a status of the switch. The switch right now is off, and it actually shows it as an open switch. When I press it, what does it do? Shows it closed and it shows a little spark there. Okay? And then you can notice that Q1 shows a light bulb that's lit. And Q2 shows a light bulb that's out. And if I hit it again, they flip flop and the switch opens up. Okay? Everybody able to follow that so far? Pretty easy? Yeah. Alright. So now let's change something. We're gonna we're gonna do a circuit that you guys are used to seeing. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna highlight this whole circuit. What you just do to get back? All I do is I turn the simulation off. Right over here, I I hit this button to turn the simulation off. You can turn it off with F3 too. With what? F3 can also turn it off. F3 toggles the simulation the same the way the same way that icon would would toggle it. That's correct. If I hit F3, it toggles the simulation. All right, so the next thing I want you to do is I want you to click on this little selection button up here. And I want you guys to highlight a big box around this circuit. And you guess what you're going to do? Delete. Hit the delete key. And we're going to start over. We're going to write, this time we're going to uh, do one that you guys may be used to seeing in third quarter. We're going to do a motor start stop circuit. Okay? So this time we'll grab a couple of make contacts. 
And again, if I select make contact, I can just start clicking on the screen. I1, I2, and so on. I can put I3, I4, I5, but just put a couple of them on the screen for right now. Okay? The next thing I want you to do is to grab a relay coil. And you might want to space them out a little bit. Maybe make it look nice and clean there. All in one line. All in one line, though. You have an I1, an I2, and a Q1. We're going to do something a little different this time. That first one was just a real, real basic example. We're going to do some settings now. Okay, I1 means nothing to me, right? If I'm looking at I1 as an address, do I know if it's a push button or a switch or a sensor? No. No. All I know is it's the I1 screw terminal. And when the I1 screw terminal is on, it's going to close. So in this case, I want you guys to double click on that I1 now that it's in the circuit. And I want you to go into the comment for I1. And under comments, I want you to write stop PB. So now what is this device? Stop, stop push button. Yeah, so when I wire this up, I'm going to wire up I1 as the stop push button. When I create the I.O. listing sheet, I'll, I'll have the I.O. listing sheet show I1 hooked up to a stop push button. And then I want you to go to simulation. Because the simulator is going to want to know, is it a switch? Is it a momentary make push button? Is it a momentary break push button? Is it a frequency? Is it an analog value? In this case, we're going to use a what? Break. A momentary push button break. And then hit OK. And what do you suppose this one's going to be? So let's go ahead and do that. Let's do a comment on the second one. This will be my start PB. So I2 now, I've put a comment of start PB on it. <coughs> and under simulation, what am I going to select? Momentary push button make. Momentary push button make. I hit OK. And then let's go over to this one, Q1. Let's put a comment on it. Let's call it my, for today, we're just going to call it my motor. Okay? Maybe it's really a motor starter. Maybe I'm using Q1 to energize a motor starter that's turning on a three-phase motor on a conveyor belt. That's possible, right? But in this case, we're just going to create the circuit and call it motor for right now. All right? Now I can hook these up. I can go to my connection tool and hook everything in series. Stop, start, and motor. Okay? But now what do I need? What am I going to need? Return? Not a return. No, you, need a, you need a maintaining contact. A maintaining contact. I definitely need a maintaining contact. So grab another make contact and put it down here right underneath the start push button. Okay, but instead of making it I3 or I4, any guesses as to what the address is going to be? Q1. Q1. If I scroll up, I have this little constants drop down here, a little plus sign next to constants. If I click on constants, guess what's available to me? Q1. It's, yeah, it's only available, only Q1 is available. Why isn't Q2 available? We don't have Q2. Yeah, there's no Q2 in the circuit. If there was a Q2, Q3, Q4 in the program, I would have those selections available also. If there was a timer or a counter in the program, those would be available. So double click on Q1 and notice what it says. It says, hey, there's your motor. Your motor contact is the holding contact. Does that make sense? Absolutely. Now one thing I want to show you is if I try to take my connection tool and connect it to here. Oh, that's the other side. What does it tell me? Incompatible connectors. Incompatible connectors. I cannot connect right to here, but I can connect anywhere on this line. So just be careful. If you ever get this message about incompatible connect connectors, you might just want to move it around and see if you can connect it somewhere else. Okay. And then I want to connect it on the other side also, right? Notice it says incompatible connectors here all the way across. What do I got to do? Go all the way over to where it says Q1. And now it's going to let me connect it. What do you guys think? Sweet. Pretty cool, huh? Did, yeah. For some reason when I type my comment for my L1, it doesn't show up. In, my, uh, in your I1? Yeah, sweet. You're, you're, you're. Sometimes the comments won't show up. If, if you're having trouble with that, delete that contact out. What you've got to do 
is place the contact first. So if I wanted to place a contact in here like I3, I got to place the contact in here without a comment. Okay? You've got to delete your comments out or your uh, your contacts out first. Place the contact in without a comment, then go in and put a comment on it, like a sensor or something. And now that comment will show up. If you ever try to comment it at the same time you first put it in there, sometimes that comment won't show up. And that is a slight bug that they probably could fix in future revisions of the software, but it's easy to overcome so we don't, we don't concern ourselves too much with it. So if you're still having trouble, when we get into lab, I'll, I'll walk around and make sure you guys are, are getting those comments on there. Uh, for right now, it does, doesn't make too much of a difference. What I'd like to do is simulate it. And let's see what happens. So let's go to F3, or go to your simulation tool here. All right? Notice something about I1 right now. I have not hit the I1 push button. But why is it already red? It's yeah, it's, it's simulating a normally closed push button, right? So that simulation setting that I put in there, I told it, hey, that's going to be a normally closed push button when we go to work on this. In real life, that I1 would be hot right now. Why would that I1 be hot right now? Yeah, because the mechanical push button for stop would normally close be routing power to I1. So the simulation is just simulating that, that fact. So now if I hit I2, what happens? Close. Yep. Notice that the I2 contact, because it was a momentary push button, this contact's actually off now, isn't it? But because I energized Q1, now the holding contact gives me that path. You can also click right on the contact to change the state of the push button. I don't have to go down here. If I click right on the contact, that's the same as hitting the push button. Notice when I hit the contact, it turns on Q1. When I release it, I2 turns off, and the holding contact provides my holding circuit. All right? Now, let's say that you wanted to uh, add a pilot light to this cir circuit. Okay, so you want to add a pilot light to this circuit. So we're going to scroll down a little bit. Maybe a green and a red LED. Oops. I'm going to be careful sometimes here. I'm going to make my, my view a little bit bigger so everybody can see it. So I'm going to add a couple of pilot lights. I'm going to add a Q2. Again, I'm going to place the coil or the contacts before I comment them. Okay? Uh, Q2 and Q3, it's, Qs are going to require you to place them first anyways. But let's call Q2 my red LED. Okay? And let's call Q3 my green LED. Now remember, it's very possible that you have all of these outputs wired up already. Okay? All you got to do is connect them in the program. All these inputs and outputs are wired up. You wire them up for the I.O. listing sheet, you connect them in the program. If I want to change which light comes on, if I want to change it from being the green LED when the motor's on to being the red LED when the motor's on, what does it actually require? Change your contact. Change your contact in the program, right? What if I wanted to do that in a hardwired circuit, in a relay-controlled circuit? What does that require? Taking your wire from your normally open. And yeah, it requires me to actually physically rewire the circuit, right? I have to move wires around. Okay, so which one's going to be quicker? Programming. This one, yeah, programming's going to be far quicker, as you're going to see later on in the quarter. Some of those circuits that you built in third quarter that were hardwired solutions, you'll be able to build them really quickly in here, make changes to them really quickly in here, and be done with it. Okay? So now, what do we want these to signify? Maybe, uh, maybe I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put an extra comment on these. I'm going to put the red LED, I'm going to call this my motor off red LED. Okay. And I'm going to call this one my motor on green LED. So my question to you is how are you going to ensure that those energize at the correct time? Exactly right. A normally open or a normally closed contact for Q1. So if I grab a make contact, which, which one would get the make contact, green or red? 
green. So I'm going to put a green, I'm going to go up to constants, and I'm going to select Q1. Notice when I select Q1 this time, what other options are available? Q2 and Q3. So I'm going to put a Q1 contact in there, and I'm going to wire this guy up. All right, and we're done. Now, there's a couple of ways that you could do it. I think the most intuitive way to do the red LED would be to grab a brake contact and address it to the motor, right? Because what are these what are these LEDs measuring? They're telling me the motor's on or the motor's off, right? Now that you have that hooked up, we ought to be able to simulate this circuit and find out if it works. So I'm going to hit F3. And notice when the motor is not on, Q1 is not energized, I get the red light, right? Uh-oh, Q2. I leave from motor 1 to motor off red light is blinking from red to blue. It's blinking? Yeah, red to blue. <laughs> and my light down here is flickering on and on. I'll take a, I'm going to take a real quick look at it here. <laughs> should, yeah, you shouldn't have any contacts that are blinking or anything right now. <laughs> That's kind of strange. Um, when I hit start, I get that light. Oh, you know why? Because you don't have the motor. What he did was instead of putting a normally closed of the motor, he put a normally closed of the other LED. They both should be Q1 contacts. A Q1 normally closed contact goes to the motor off LED. A Q1 normally open contact goes to the motor on LED, okay? All right, so then let's, I think that's perfect right now. Let's kind of just leave it there. You can test it out and see if it works. Start gives me green, stop gives me red. When I get the green, I'm also getting the motor. So the lights are doing what? They're tracking whether or not the motor's on, okay? Let's do another interesting one. I'm going to... I'm going to delete this whole one. Did everybody get this one to work? Yeah. Or somewhat work at least? Okay. You're going to get tons of practice with this in your, uh, your upcoming jobs. You're going to get a lot of practice with this. I just want to show you a little bit of the advanced functionality of this guy. Okay. Let's, uh, let's do this. Let's, um, let's delete just part of it. Let's just delete the bottom section of it. Or delete the whole thing. I don't I guess we can delete the whole thing. Let's just delete the whole thing. Because we got a couple people that already deleted the whole thing. Alright? We got it back. What's that? We got it back. Oh, you get it back? Edit undo. Can everybody get back to at least this point? <laughs> no, I'm not gonna sweat it then. We'll delete the whole thing. Let's start all over. What I'm gonna do this time. Ooh, I've got a little bit of an error here. You know what you can do? Sometimes if you do the undo, redo functions, sometimes you'll get little bits and pieces that are junk. What you guys can actually do to get out of there is just close this file and don't save the changes and just open up a new one. So I got a new ladder diagram. Just a fresh sheet. Start all over again. So I closed it up. You can actually close it by right clicking on that little tab for circuit diagram and going to close, and if it asks you if you want to save, just hit no, unless you really want it for some reason. Go to the drop down, and go to the new ladder diagram. All right, the next thing we're gonna do is we're gonna show off a little bit of the, maybe just a little bit of the advanced functionality. So let's, uh, let's go ahead and throw a make contact in here. We'll throw a couple of them in here, and a relay coil. As much as I hate to say it, I think we're going to build another system, uh, another uh, motor start stop. But we're not going to have it be a motor start stop circuit this time. We're going to use what's called a flag. Okay, you have all of these in here now. But I want to go into the Q1. I want you to double click on Q1. And instead of using Q1, I want you to scroll up and I want you to use the M1 flag. Okay, the M1 flag. The M1 flag 
is basically like an internal relay coil. It doesn't have any connections to the outside world. It doesn't eat up any of your Q outputs, but it allows you to trigger events. You know what I mean? So let's, let's go ahead and throw this circuit together and you'll see what I'm talking about here. Comment on this one will be my stop PB. Make sure on I1 you do a momentary break. So I1 is a momentary break simulation with a stop PB comment. So I1 commented as stop PB, simulation as momentary break. But it is a make contact. I2 comment start PB, simulation momentary make, and you're done with I2. Now instead of instead of having a Q1 that we address as M1, or that we address as a Q1 that we address as motor, we're going to address an M1, a flag coil, an internal relay coil. Doesn't actually eat up any of our output screw terminals. We're going to address that as what I call the system run bit. So I have start, I have stop, and I have what's, what I'm going to call my system run bit. Okay? I'm going to connect those guys up. And then I'm going to put a contact in parallel with the start push button. And before I do it though, I'm going to, I'm going to take it out for a second. Before I put this contact here, what do you suppose the address of that contact should be? M1, system run bit, exactly right. So I throw a contact in there, I scroll up, I go under constants just like I did for Q1, but now I'm going to select what's available to me is M1. Now my system run bit is what? It's the holding contact also, right? You can also, if you ever see how I got this comment that's kind of getting cut off here, if you go to your selection tool, you can just kind of move that comment a little bit to get it back where you want it so it looks sharp, okay? <coughs> so I have system run bit. If I hit start and stop, if I were to simulate the circuit, start gives me system run, stop takes it away, start gives me system run, stop takes it away. But now let's say I want to trigger an event, <coughs> okay? I want to trigger an event. When I hit start, I want it to wait five seconds and then turn on the motor, okay? So I'm going to take a make contact. I'm going to go down here and I'm going to address that make contact to system run bit. So I'm starting a second network or a second rung of the ladder diagram and this is my system run bit. Now I can connect it up right now. Um, we're not officially talking about timers or counters or anything like that yet. Okay, but I am going to show you one just to get you an idea of how other items start popping into your selections. Okay, if, I, if you notice, if I go into this contact, all I have available, I can address it as an input, I can address it as a cursor key. The cursor key are those little push buttons on the front of the logo. I can address it as shift register bits, which we haven't talked about it yet. I can have it always be high, I could have it always be low, all right? But the only thing I have outside of those standard inputs is M1 right now. But as soon as I throw in something else, that becomes an option. So as an example, if you grab an on-delay timer, go to on-delay underneath timers here, and I throw that on-delay timer in over here. We're not going to talk about why it works or how it works yet. That's not tomorrow's lecture, but the day, or not Monday's lecture, but be the day after. Okay, what we're going to do is we're just going to say that this is definitely an on-delay timer. It's going to delay start something. So now I'm going to go ahead and connect this guy up to my M1. Every contact, every coil, every box, everything in your program gets a comment. So I'm going to put a comment on this timer. Five second motor on delay. And the more intuitive your comment is, the easier it is 
for someone that's troubleshooting or debugging your software or your program to make sense of why you did this. Okay? So it's always a good idea to comment these completely. All right? I also need to go into this timer though. Double click on that timer. I need to set my on delay. Notice that I have full seconds and one hundredths of seconds. Okay? And I know they're one hundredths of seconds because it says seconds, and in parentheses it's got seconds colon one one hundredths of seconds. All right? I could change that. I could have it be a, a 20 minute timer. Okay, maybe I, I, who knows, maybe I have a timer that comes on and starts something 20 minutes after I do it. Okay, maybe I have a timer that comes on several minutes later. But in this case, we're definitely going to use the second one because we want it to be a five second timer, right? And we set it to five seconds. What if I'd set this one to five? What would it be? Five one hundredths of a second. Yeah, you're not even going to see that. That's too quick, right? So we're going to have five seconds. All of this other stuff we're going to talk about, you know, block name, retentivity, protection. We're, we're not going to talk about that today. We're just going to introduce you to the software, show you where some of the tools are. Now, let's say down here I want to put a relay coil. And this relay coil I'm going to call Q1, and Q1 is my motor. Okay. Now, do I ever want my motor to run when system run is not there? No. 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 So one of the things I can, you can get in the habit of doing is having a system run bit in every single network. You might have a make of the system run bit. You might have a break of the system run bit. When I hit start, I get system run. I want things to happen. Maybe when I hit stop, when I lose system run, maybe I want different things to happen. Example here. I hit start. I want a fan to come on for a minute and then the machine to turn on. When I hit stop, I want the machine to turn off, but I want that fan to stay on for a minute to cool it down. So on the one side, system run is triggering events, but the lack of system run could also trigger events. If you don't understand that right now, just kind of wrap your head around it a little bit. We're not getting that deep yet. Mm -hmm. So I've got the system run bit, but I want that timer. To, to control the motor. So what other contact do I need in series with that? A normally open. Normally open address to what? Timer. Yeah, absolutely. So the normally open is going to be addressed to T001. And I'm going to come across. I'm going to connect these up. Now we got to think back to Boolean logic for a second. I'm going to ask you a couple of quick questions here. I'm kind of moving my comments around as I do it though. Make it kind of center them here. Here's a Boolean logic question. What type of gate is this down in the third rung? An AND gate. It's a what? An AND gate. That's an AND gate. What type of gate is this up here? OR. This is an OR gate in series with an AND, AND gate. So it takes I1 AND I2 OR M1. Remember that? We did that, I think we did that yesterday, didn't we? Yep. We talked about that. That's one of the examples we did. And one of the reasons why we do that example is because of this. Okay? So now let's go ahead and go into the simulation tool. And go ahead and try it up. When I start it, notice the timer starts timing. Five seconds later, what happens? Turns on. And when I hit stop, what happens? That is awesome. Why is that awesome? Because what extra components would you have had to use in a hardwired solution? A timer, a timer, a a timer relay, relay maybe oil. another contactor, all kinds of other stuff that if someone would have said, hey, I've got this start stop and I've got a motor wired up. Hey, but I want you guys to put a timer on it. You've got to tear that wiring apart and get that timing relay in there. If I have a start, and a stop wired up to a PLC, and a motor wired up to that PLC, did I add any extra hardwired components to this circuit? No. No. It's the exact same circuit as if I didn't have the timer in there. Question. Right, you got the stop and start buttons. Yeah. Do you put those as your cursor buttons? Cursor buttons. Because it has to yes. Could you put those as your cursor buttons? Absolutely. The keypad, if you look at the front of the logo, the keypad has these cursors. 
you can actually make those cursors be inputs. So would I even have to wire up a start and stop push button? No, let's try it once just for the fun of it. Okay, we're getting really deep now. But let's, let's just give it a whirl. Let's go ahead and change I1. I'm going to change it to cursor 1 up. And I'm going to change I2 to cursor 2 down. Okay? And then I'm going to put a comment on them. Okay, and I'm going to, I, at what point, now what do I call them? I don't know. Maybe I call it my, uh, my stop cursor. <laughs> cursor key or stop cursor button. Or, you know, you guys get the idea. You're going to have to come up with a more intuitive uh, comment for it. But it's my stop cursor button is up. And maybe this one's my start cursor button. And if I knew how to spell cursor, that would help. So I have stop cursor button and start cursor button. If I go to simulate, notice what it would do. It would actually show me, instead of switches down there, what does it show me? The cursors, right? Except we have a problem here, don't we? The cursor buttons are what? They're normally open push buttons. Okay? Unlike what I was doing before, we might be able to change them in the simulation, but I kind of doubt it. Oh no, you can change them. That one could be a momentary break. This one could be a momentary make. You know what else though? Let's say you were off on the logic there. You could always, you could always put the reverse contact in there, right? To fix something if you ever needed to. Let's try it one more time, see if it works. Now it's working perfect. When I hit this button, I get the motor to turn on. And when I hit this button, I get the motor to turn off. Again, notice how much you can change the program, how many things I can add. I'm gonna, when, we're going to go over all these timers and cursors and counters and weekly timers and yearly timers and all of this stuff over the course of the next week or so. Um, but the thing to notice is if I wired up four push buttons and four outputs, I could do anything with those things. I could have them sequence, I could have them time, I could have them turn on on certain days of the week. Where is that valuable? Let's say that those four outputs are wired up to solenoid valves on your sprinkler system. Okay? And you have a start and stop for each zone. I1, I2, I3, I4, I5, I6. You have three zones. You have a start and stop. So you can manually start and stop those zones, turn on your sprinklers, right? But you could also set in a, a weekly and a yearly timer. These guys down here. I could set in a weekly timer and a yearly timer, and I could determine, okay, I want those those sprinklers to turn on Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. Zone 1 from 6 o'clock to 6.15. Zone 2 from 6.15 to 6.30. And zone 3 from 6.30 to 6.45. But only on Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. But I also only want that to work from June to October. Now you've completely automated your sprinkler system. But you still have the capability to manually control it, right? And this is all with the hardware of a Siemens logo that if you went on to eBay right now, <laughs> You would find out, let's just let's do it once real quick, that this little logo and, and sprinkler system, just something I'm interested in, any automation project, maybe you're into woodworking and you have a dust collector in your garage for your woodworking machines. You could have any woodworking machine be an input to the PLC, turn on your dust collector. Maybe let that let the PLC keep that dust collector running for five minutes after you shut down all the machines. You know, what whatever it is. I don't know, I'm not a, a woodworker. But you could go into eBay right now and type in Siemens logo and look how inexpensive this technology actually is. Siemens logo, in the box, new in box sealed. This has one day left on the auction, three bids, and there's a bunch of them on here, you know, and the uh, current bid is $29.99 and I might have to go bid on this across the hall here in a minute <laughs> because this is an actual OBA5. That's the current model that you guys are working on. That's the latest and greatest PLC, the 230RC with the AC inputs and the relay outputs, the intercalated clock, all of that. And how many of them they, do they have? They have four available. I'm guessing, you know, sometimes when you have one available, within the last hour of the auction, what happens to that price? Jacks right up, right? But when you have four available, it tends to keep the price down a little bit, right? 
Yeah, yeah, I know. I, I, we're going to start a bidding war in this class now. But as you can see here, this technology is inexpensive. What does that mean? Take it home and put it in your uh, your apartment, you know, and you have a button that's party mode and a button that's candlelight mode and a button that, you know, so when you bring your date home or whatever, you can do kind of different things there. Um, <laughs> yeah. You time it up so every Friday night. <laughs> The other, thing, the other thing is, this is, now mind you, this is buying it on eBay. eBay is always slightly cheaper than if you were to go over to Viking Electric and buy one, right? But guess what? Viking Electric, 90 bucks, okay? 90 bucks. The other thing you would have to concern yourself with is, this may not come with something you want. What is the something that you might need with this? A cable. Oh, yeah. A programming cable. But with the logo, unlike the S7200, unlike the Allen Bradley Slicks or the Compact Logics, the Siemens logo, the IDEX Smart Relay, the uh, the Ellen Bradley Pico, all of those can be programmed how? Either the keypad. The keypad. Do you need a cable? No. no. Absolutely not. They want 70 bucks for that cable. They want 70 bucks for that cable. That is a true statement. Yeah. The cable is as expensive as the logo is. But the nice thing is if I was setting this up on a sprinkler system, might be a half hour programming using the keypad, my sprinkler system's done. It's getting to the point now where programmable devices like this are actually as inexpensive as a the true solution, like the sprinkler timer that you would buy at a Home Depot or Menards or something. Question? Okay, say, so say you got this uh, Siemens logo for your sprinkler system, uh, you get an EEPROM. This craps out on it. Uh, you decide not to go with Siemens, you go with... Al Bradley or okay, something. Okay, yeah. Can you use your EEPROM to... No, the EEPROM is not compatible with, with all of them. I will say this though, if you look at, we know what the Siemens logo looks like, right? right? Take a snapshot of that in your head, okay? Take a snapshot of that in your head. If you go and you go to Google, I showed you guys this already, didn't I? And I type in IDEC Smart Relay. Some of them, now you just gotta, you know, bear with me for a second here, and say, okay, is IDEC really making this, this equipment because uh oh, come on Google. I'm just going to ask you guys, do you guys think that IDEC is making their own smart relay? Yeah, sure. <laughs> I wish I could get the bigger image here. Let me go back. I'll, I'll get a big image here that you guys can see clear, clear here. Let, let me just, I mean, here's the IDEC smart relay. Okay, let's see here. That looks like that. Um, here's the, the Siemens logo. Yeah, yeah that's kind of... Yeah, it's, it's white. white. So they might be incompatible because one is white and one's uh, dark gray in color. Um, let, let's try something else here because this is this is nice to get on the tape. Um, Alan... Hey, what's that over there with the two EEPROM? Or is that two? That's the memory cartridges. Yeah, that's showing two your EEPROM there. there. Showing a couple of different EEPROMs. One of, I don't know for sure, but one of them could be a dust cover and the other one could be the EEPROM chip. Maybe it's two different color EEPROMs. But I just want to show you one other, uh, what Alan Bradley makes called the Alan Bradley Pico. And we'll, we'll, we'll take a peek here and see, because uh, I know that they all, you know, some people will claim, oh, Alan Bradley's the best PLC ever made. You know, it's so much better than Siemens. Um, and when, when we look at this, this image here, I just, you know, it's a smaller image. But I want you to take a look at this this one right here. Does that look like anything you guys have ever seen? It looks pretty close to the. Uh... Yeah, it's it's 99 percent identical <laughs> to the Siemens logo to the IDEX Smart Relay. Um, one of them I think is called the is it the Zelio, Jeff? Is that right? Is that what Square D makes? Please. Square D makes I think what's called the Zelio. Mitsubishi makes one. Uh, Panasonic makes one, you know, and these people, they get into these mindsets about, hey, you better be using Alan Bradley, you better be using Siemens, I only use Armour, I'll never touch that Siemens stuff. Well, look at the Zelio for a second. Yeah, it, you know, if you, if you ask me, yeah, that's great that they have a little bit different button configuration. Okay, so the buttons are a little bit different style button between the, the Zelio and the Pico. The IDEX Smart Relay and the logo, they're, they're, they're pretty much identical. You know, the, the software I know for sure is slightly different, okay? But I don't know for sure, but I'd almost guess that maybe the software would be compatible from the one platform to the other. 
That's something we could try if anybody ever gets a hold of an IDEX Smart Relay. So you could actually go on eBay, and you could buy any one of these, right? And more than likely, just based on your training that we've given you in this class, in a very short period of time, you could teach yourself how to program on the keypad the IDEX Smart Relay, the uh, Square D Zelio. It's actually Telemechanic A. It's not, uh, it's not Square D. It's the Telemechanic. Some people say Telemechanic, and some people say Telemechanic. No, it's Telemechanic. I, I can't say It's a French word. It's the Zelio. Okay, it's a Smart Relay, or any of them. You could be able to work with any of these guys. Okay? And they're all programmed in ladder logic and function block diagram. So, you guys excited? Oh, yeah. Absolutely. That's it.